talk about um, ARDS, especially in neuro patients. We're exactly um, one hour and three minutes late. Exactly is the update of ARDS. You all know what ARDS is. I don't need to tell you what it is. In particular, what does that mean in neuro patient? This is actually a real patient, how nasty it is. It is visually striking. You can see the intense inflammatory and all those cytokines and break down between the airway and then plasma and all kinds of reaction is happening. You know, this occurs rather commonly in neural unit. And why is that? I was talking to um, Dr. Holcomb, uh, head of a trauma, Texas Trauma Institute in Houston where I work, um, and, and he told me that he doesn't see ARDS anymore. It's rather rare. Well, I see it every week. <laughs> I don't know why that is in, in neuro ICU. For some, and, and I must realize, and we should all be honest, and say some of that they develop while they're, in, on, while they're, you know, while you're trying to get them better. So I'd like to start my uh, talk with a, a real case that I had in New York City. This, this is a 19-year-old a uh, uh, a guy who was uh, actually riding a Ford F-150 4x4 uh, truck. You know, as you know, the, there's a cargo area in the back, and he got ejected during a car crash. And uh, he went to the outside hospital, and his uh, initial GCS was three. Uh, he had a multi-organ failure, blown pupil, essentially comatose disorder posturing. They did a, a aggressive ICP management. As you can imagine, a a severe TBI, for some reason this slide is automatically advancing. Uh, with the uh, uh, severe TBI, uh, ICP mo uh, monitoring showing a high ICP with a low CPP, one of the things that you do, as you heard from Dr. Polderman, is to secure the airway and control the CO2, et cetera. And there are other things that you do that's hypertonic saline, which is one of the new kids on the block. It's been around for a while being used widely around the world, and that has a problem. The fluid management becomes a challenging issue. And this patient, uh, actually the other uh, outside hospital basically gave up on him. His multi-organ failure, and uh, this, is, this is his real chest x-ray. And uh, at that point, uh, in comatose, near brain dead, uh, lung failure, heart failure, renal failure, hepatic failure, pulmonary contusion, you name it. Um, on, on triple pressors. So basically, this is how it came to uh, us. Uh, we did ECMO for ARDS. Uh, at this point, a proning is not going to work. At this point, nitric oxide is not going to work. The only thing that has, that has any chance of survival will be ECMO. It's exactly what we, had, what we did. And after that, he was still in coma. Uh, you can see the um, ICP monitoring on the left, on the right hand. Oops here, right side of his brain, that's the uh, ICP bolt and PBTO2 that they put in at outside hospital. And he came to me with multi-organ failure, and we just fixed the ARDS, and he's still comatose. Okay, how's the brain doing? Well, how do you know when somebody's, how that patient's doing? Well, we do neuro exam. Well, guess what? There is no neuro exam. He never had one. He was comatose, near brain dead. Well, how do you know how the patient's doing? Well, there are a couple of ways of doing it, right? First, you can see through the skull. Do a CAT scan. Well, what does a CAT scan show? Uh, well, it's, it's just bruised brain and, and it looks bad, but, but, but it's not dead yet. It's not hypodensity everywhere. Then, then you put a multimodality monitoring. You put a, you know, uh, a PBTO2 and ICP monitoring on one side. I say, well, what's the ICP? Well, they say it's not working. Perfect, let me put another one. <laughs> so uh, this is the uh, uh, catheter that I actually placed myself uh, on the left side right here, a uh, uh, triple lumen catheter there. Which, so, so as a result, we had a bilateral PBTO2, one of the few cases that I have on my logbook of the bilateral PBTO2 and bilateral uh, uh, LPR, et cetera. So, I'm digressing a little bit, but, but this patient, it, 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 it all ties into the same thing. They have an a, a oxygenation problem with the lung, then have a brain problem, a comatose, you have no exam to follow. CAT scan doesn't help you because it looks the same. You can repeat CAT scan all you want, it's going to look the same. 
Now, the brain goals, I think, is just as important as hemodynamic goals or vice versa. So the, I had a specific brain goals. Well, we want ICP to be, to be managed. We want CPP to be optimized. We want oxygen to be good. We don't know what the good oxygenation is. Nobody knows. But you know what? Who cares? I want a better outcome. Instead of arguing, is it 10 or is it 15 of PBTO2, I want to have every variable to be optimized as possible. Kind of like what Professor Poldemo was talking about. An injured brain would like things to be close, as close as possible to be normal. So we want the oxygen to be normal rather than too low. Again, arbitrary number. We need more number in this, more, more data in this, but my goal was 15. We want JVO2, SJVO2, to put a, a catheter in the neck, to be uh, uh, adequate. I want LPR to be not tremendously high. We, more, we need more data on this as well. I wanted glucose in the brain to be not too low. Tight glucose is not a good thing in a very injured brain. We're finding more and more about that. Put a direct CBF monitoring uh, uh, invented by uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Bowman from MIT, who was a former MIT professor who, who now is no longer teaches there, but is now the CEO of the Hemodex monitor, which has, has pros and cons about it. But anyway, we had that in, and then we wanted a good flow. At the same time, we had a hemodynamic goals, which is one of my research uh, uh, interests, that we want the cardiac uh, status to be good, namely, the cardiac output, which I believe plays a role in brain oxygenation, needs to be optimized. And in order to optimize it, we had a specific goal of a cardiac index, stroke volume, stroke volume index, as well as stroke volume variation. He was comatose for uh, four weeks. Uh, three months later, his modified ranking was zero. Um, we didn't think that he'll, he'll do that well. He had zero symptom, zero deficit definition of zero MRS. Rather incredible, incredible recovery. Um, again, we didn't know he was going to do that well, but the lesson I learned from that is, is that uh, young people can really do well after severe TBI, even in the setting of uh, multi-organ failure. We often create ARDS, and this is historically speaking in the setting of a vasospasm management in, a, in subarachnoid hemorrhage because uh, 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 one of which includes a Triple H therapy, as you know, is a hypervolemic therapy. So you give fluid after fluid after fluid. Some people do fluid from day zero. This looks like a thick clot. I think the spasm risk is high. I want fluid. See you later. And the patient ends up getting fluid of a day zero. My gut tells me this patient's gonna develop symptomatic not just TCD, but angiographic and symptomatic spasm. I know I want fluid. Well, patients, no deficit. I don't care. I want fluid. A lot of people do that. And, and, and that's probably not the best medicine. And ICU management of cerebral vasospasm is rather important. And this brings us to a volume expansion, elevation of the blood pressure, augmentation of the C cardiac output. And the reason why I'm talking about this when I'm supposed to be talking about the lung is because we often create ARDS. The moment you have aspiration pneumonia and you f flood them with fluid, it's just a <laughs> matter of time before you create ARDS. It happens more commonly than you think. Problem with the volume expansion is that if you give more IV fluid, you get more urine output. <laughs> Your cardiac filling pressure goes up, but you don't necessarily improve the outcome. You're not even improving the uh, delivery of oxygen after some point. In fact, you are reducing the oxygenation of the end organ system because you're having trouble having the cardiac, uh, uh, the oxygen carbon dioxide exchange at, at, at the lung level. I'm going to speed up. Tim, who's my current boss at UT Houston, he collaborated between Brigham and Women and UT Houston uh, a few years ago. And basically what he did was, well, you know what? I, I got a patient with a deficit, hypoperfusion. And he showed that. You can see the hyperperfused area in the frontal lobe here, in a figure A on my arrow right here. You see that it's color-coded. Blue and black means hypoperfusion, and green and red means hyper. You can see that from uh, bef after starting a phenylephrine drip, 
you can actually make the deficit get better. You see how the blue area turns into yellow and red? You can visually quantify that using the Xenon CAT scan. You can also, that, that, that's, that's something you can do by elevating the blood pressure. You can also leave the pressure alone, same pressure, but increase the cardiac index. Here, he demonstrated by using the dobutamine, which in the beginning actually can drop the blood pressure. Why? Why is that? Because it has a vasodilation character uh, before it increases the cardiac output. So anyway, the, pr the, the, the point of the story is that the pressure remained the same, and by increasing the cardiac output, he can actually show an elevation in perfusion without increasing the blood pressure. Take, take a look at the um, volume, I don't have the volume picture here, but what he found here is that if you increase the blood pressure, pr hyperperfusion gets better. If you increase the cardiac output, hyperperfusion gets better. But when you just pour fluid, it might not make things better. Showing that the volume, when you're already euvolemic, may not lead to better or improved oxygen delivery. So I'm going to, uh, today, uh, the fluid management is very important. There's no way an ARDS patient can get better if you keep them wet. If you are wet, there's no way your AD, ARDS can get better. Therefore, a intravascular volume management is important. There are different toys out there, uh, toys that, are, that weren't available years ago. Now they are available, um, one of which I have, I have, no, I have zero disclosure to make. Um, I used to, not anymore. Um, and, and the cardiac output, you can see this is a, a, a pulse contour non-invasive monitoring. You can see the cardiac output going up as you see a stroke volume going up and as you can see the stroke volume variation goes down. This is almost a textbook picture perfect situation in which that you're increasing the volume and it's leading to a augmentation of cardiac output and dropping in stroke volume vari uh, variation. Um, this is a, one of the new technologies showing that one of the uh, company people actually asked me a few years ago, hey, Dr. Lee, if you can design it, how would you design it? Well, I said I would design it, draw a picture of the lung and draw a picture of the heart in the middle and make it become blue if it becomes wet, make it becomes red if it becomes normal. And they, they actually did that. Um, so I'm kind of glad to see how they make this uh, rather visually, visually, um, I don't know if the inspiration is the right word, but you can actually appreciate, visually appreciate the, uh, how hard the, heart, uh, the lungs are doing. But you know, regardless of which technology you use, what the bottom line is you need more information. And it's very important to pay attention to intravascular volume, volume status if you are interested in making someone with ARDS in the setting of acute brain injury to have a chance to have a better outcome. Thank you.